Today we celebrate 50,000 subscribers to this channel, and I say we because I'm highly aware of how influential and important all of you have been to the success of this channel. I'll never be able to say thank you well enough, but I thought that at least a Q&A might be a fun way to interact a bit more, help you get to know me, and see a little bit behind the scenes here. If you want to get straight to the questions, no problem, there's timestamps down below, but I'd like to take a couple minutes up front to try and say thank you. There are many unsung heroes of this channel. In fact, if you've ever watched even one video, you have helped this channel grow. And many of you have watched one or a few or many, and you never comment, you never share, and you never like. And you know what? That's still unbelievable. It's still crazy to me that I can help reach so many people. For those of you that take any additional step, let me just say an additional thank you. Whether you give a like or you watch every video or you're one of the people that watches the videos all the way through because you know that it helps, or maybe you're one of the people that shared on Reddit or Facebook or some other platform. Maybe you are really active in the comments, going back and forth, encouraging other people who are reaching out for help or even helping to defend me sometimes when I get a bunch of questions or pushback and I simply don't have the time or will to get to them. I don't take for granted any of you who have been here and helped in any capacity, no matter how small, but I do want to take an extra second to say especially thank you to those of you who have financially given to the channel. Some of you do it just through a random super chat here or there, and many of you have joined the Patreon, which is absolutely amazing and 100% necessary for me to continue to do this. I know some of you give it a lower level and some of you give it a higher level, and all of you deserve more than what I've been able to to give you. I recognize that in terms of having a Patreon, I am not one of the content creators that is posting an extra video or giving you previews because my biggest goal is to make sure that for over a year and a half now that I've been doing this, I've been able to put out three high quality, useful videos every single week without fail. And with hundreds of videos under my belt now, I feel very proud about that. I wish I could give you more. I wish I was one of those channels, but I also know that I put out a lot more content than most channels do. And the only way that I've been able to do this, to be able to justify it, to be able to take away from some of the additional consulting work that I was doing on the side, to be able to provide the way that I want to, is by your guys' financial support. So again, it means everything. I'm so sorry I can't do more in return. I hope the videos are enough. I will never blame anyone for leaving. I don't expect everyone to give for life. For those of you that have been giving for a long time, thank you so much. Please continue to do so if you can. If you've considered giving and haven't pulled the trigger yet, now might be a good time to think about it. Help me get to 100,000 subscribers. That will be our next huge goal for the channel. Okay, all of that out of the way and a very sincere thank you. Let's get to your questions. Would you still take down Christianity if it weren't for its immorality? That's a good question. By the way, I haven't seen most of these. I saw a few as they came in, but I really wanted this to be off the cuff. I don't think so, at least not to the same extent. My biggest goal on the channel is simply to help people who were in my position. I've said it a lot of different ways, but really that's what it boils down to. It's hard to change your worldview. It's hard to start over in any capacity, but from religion, with a fear of hell, the shame, the guilt, the judgment from others, that alone makes it worthwhile. And then yes, you do consider that many of the tenants, the vast majority, are actually immoral and harmful and disbeneficial to people's lives, or at least if taken seriously, have the byproduct of harm, then I think it's a fight worth fighting. But if this religion were true and beneficial, I don't think I'd have anything to say about it. Sorry, my voice is going to crack a lot. I'm still pretty darn sick. Let's move on to the next question. Do you see yourself writing a book? Also, I just heard that some people think we atheists have an extremist viewpoint when it comes to religion. What are your thoughts? Someday I would love to write a book. Writing is kind of my first love. As many of you know, I used to have a booktube channel. I'm an avid reader. I've read thousands of books so far in my life, and it would be nice to contribute at least one in the grand scheme of things at some point. As for believers that think we are extremist against religion, I think there are militant atheists out there. I think that term gets abused. To my understanding, a militant atheist is someone who is actively working to end religion. That is not my goal. I am actively working to help people. I am actively working to help people think better, think more critically, believe true things, believe beneficial things, and reduce harm. If that makes me extremist, so be it. But I do think most of the time, people who are asserting this kind of thing, their religion is their entire life. And someone saying their entire life isn't true or produces harm, 
feels like an extreme attack. I totally understand that. I just think they haven't thought all the way through it and that it's more of a personal defense than anything else. How many topics of Christianity do you think are left for you to cover and do you intend on covering other religions at some point like Islam? I'm surprised I still have anything to say. I remember truly within the first couple weeks of making these videos, I was like, yeah, maybe I'll do this for like a month, two months. I'm sure I'm going to run out of things to say. You know, some of my first videos were like major topics. I talked about the problem with prayer, the problem with free will, the problem with the witness of the Holy Spirit. And I thought, yeah, there's probably, you know, a handful of more things to say. And then I started the secular Bible study series and I thought, well, there's 66 more episodes at least. And then I started doing some reaction videos and I thought, yeah, I can probably get some mileage out of this. But I mean, eventually there's not going to be anything else to say. And almost every week I kind of wonder, what am I going to talk about? But then some clip comes up or I get some idea or someone wrote a comment or I wrote a comment back to someone and it sparked something or I said something in a video and I'm like, oh, I'd like to actually expand on that. And here we are. And I keep a list on my phone and it's hundreds long. Unless it gets boring for you guys, I don't think I'm going to run out of material anytime soon. I mean, think about it this way. People have been able to keep preaching on the same Bible for the last few millennia, roughly. If they can do it, I can do it. As for covering other religions, Yes and no. At a high level, sure. Like I had my conversation with Apostate Aladdin on the connection between Christianity and Islam. I have an interview lined up with an ex-Mormon and an ex-Hindu. And so, yeah, from that regard, I'd like to cover religions, but I simply don't have the personal experience that makes part of what I do here work so well in any of these other religions. And there are people who have left those religions that can speak to it much better than myself. Where this channel would branch out to before other religions in a serious tone would be other mythologies and philosophy in general. What is your favorite book of the Bible? It's a pretty cliche atheist answer. I feel like most atheists really like Job or they really like Ecclesiastes. And funny enough, those were two of my favorite books even when I was a believer. I've always been fascinated by the philosophy in both of them. And even as a believer, I really liked the idea of wrestling with God. I loved the story of Jacob. And no one wrestles with God more than Job. So those two are by far my favorite. I also think Genesis is phenomenally interesting once you let go of it from a fundamentalist point of view. I enjoy Genesis now like I enjoy the Greek myths. From a New Testament perspective, Hebrews was always my favorite. I see it differently now, but still just as fascinating to me. And for the Gospels, I've gone back and forth, but probably Mark. But each book really offers something very different, and there are things to like about most of the books of the Bible too, and I hope that I've shown that side of it during SBS as well. This person notes it's a serious question. Why didn't God cast Satan down to Pluto, Neptune, or Planet X? Remember Planet X? Vaguely, Planet X was like some hypothetical planet that needed to be past Neptune or something like that. And it's a good question. It aligns very well with my Why Did God Spare Satan video. It's just a different way of asking this. Like, God could have done anything other than literally send Satan to the one planet that he had his perfect, precious humans on. He could have sent him to these other planets. He could have destroyed him. He could have locked him up deep in the vast universe that we'll never be able to reach. But no, it had to be here. He has to have the agenda of trying to hurt us, which makes no sense. And the answer, I think, is kind of what I covered at the beginning of that. It works for the story. You need an antagonist. All good stories have them. And this is just mythology at the end of the day. So that's what I think. Is it possible to convince a very entrenched Christian that they are on the wrong path? Is it a lost cause? Something then they have to come to themselves. Do I make it worse by questioning their beliefs? What a hard question. I think about this all the time. First of all, I have people in my life that, and I know this probably sounds crazy to you guys considering what I do, and for those of you that think I do it well, but I have not deconverted anybody that I know personally. Jesus himself says a prophet is not regarded in his own town. Now, not calling myself a prophet, but I think that the influence that we have as ex-Christians is extremely limited to those who knew us when we still were believers or who just know us in general. However, I don't think anyone is a lost cause. I'm proof myself that the most ardent of believers can absolutely make a huge shift. Can you do more harm than good? It depends on how you go about it. If you can get into a genuine conversation and just say, hey, I'd really like you to consider this. This is what made me lose my faith. And I'm wondering if you have a good answer to this or if you've even ever thought of it. I think that goes a long way. And it might take years, by the way. The very first time I had like a true doubt, not just like a, oh, that's a weird question. I wonder how that's explained, but I'm sure there's an answer. 
But from that very first, like, huh, all the way to where I am now, a decade. So if you have people in your life you care about that you see are being harmed by religion, I think you do have a right or even a responsibility, maybe, if you really believe it's harmful to say something. And this is the same excuse I'd give to the believer, or I should say justification. If they really believe I'm going to hell, I understand, even though I find it annoying and ridiculous at this point, why they want to preach to me. I think motives matter. If you're trying to win an argument or you want to be a debate bro, probably not. But if you see something that is going wrong and you think you can help, try. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Oh, well, I don't want to separate my crowd so quickly, but no. Of course not. Do you ever experience times when you become restless at night thinking about the non-zero possibility that we both might be, in truth, actually deceived by an unseen force? Does it crawl into my mind every once in a while? What if I'm wrong? Of course. And I think that that's a good thing. Some of it, I think, is just years of indoctrination and deep-seated fear, and fear is very powerful. Some of it, I think, is a healthy skepticism, even of doubting my doubt. But it's become less frequent, and when it does happen, it's much easier to overcome because of a few things. Things. One, when you really see just how clearly man-made this all is, just how inaccurate and inconsistent and fundamentally doesn't work this Bible is, this God concept is, it loses a lot of its power. It really does. And the more you learn, the more you become sure. I know that many people who were never believers will look at this question and be like, oh, see, you still struggle. No, not really. But there is a huge difference between losing your belief in the Easter Bunny and losing your belief in a God that you thought you loved and had a personal relationship relationship with for 30 years, especially because baked into that story is what this person's talking about, the concept of deception, of being deceived, of maybe I gave myself over to sin, maybe I let my doubt cause a rift between me and God. But then I just go back to what kind of a God would it be who lets a enemy of mine have control over my heart or mind to such a degree that I could no longer find truth. It's either a God that doesn't exist or doesn't deserve my lover relationship. And that is usually the thought that just kind of settles it. But if I really needed to, I can dig through what I know and say, oh yeah, fundamentally, this doesn't work. How did Christianity become the most popular religion? Well, this is a multifaceted thing. And if it wasn't Christianity, it would be some other religion. And it has been other religions, and it will be other religions. Islam will take over Christianity in most of our lifetimes. That's pretty crazy. It doesn't make Islam any more true, just like it doesn't make Christianity true now, just because it's so influential. A lot of people make this appeal to majority to prove the truth of the religion. And that just makes them ignorant of history. Because throughout history, there have been a lot of other religions religions that were just as prominent among the people at that time. But specifically to answer your question, and I'm not saying you were making an appeal to majority, from a historical standpoint, it became useful. It was around at the right time. When it was just Judaism, notice that it did not have the crazy spread that it had. There's a few reasons for that. Judaism doesn't have the same calls for evangelism. Christianity does. Just as simple as the Great Commission from Christ before his ascension really does a lot for the Christian faith. Then you take the fact that half of of our New Testament was written by the missionary of missionaries, someone that believed in planning and fundraising and moving around and sharing this word, calling it a mission and being willing to suffer for it and attributing glory to that suffering. So you create kind of this not only call to evangelism, but you reward the struggle of it by it being the highest duty of man. Then the powers that be, in this case, Rome, find it useful and help spread it. And then as that control shifts throughout the ages, it was many times done at the tip of the sword through conquest, there's no doubt about it. And I'm skipping a lot here, by the way, but another really huge point is that the people who first colonized and settled the Americas happened to be believers, or at least have this as their cultural religion. And then this country, because of its resources and everything that happened here, and it became a world power, that influence continued to spread and was a good base to send out missionaries. And there's just so much that has gone into this that I'm, I feel the injustice I'm doing to the answer. But long story short, evangelism, a concept of heaven and hell, you need a carrot and a stick. The religions that don't have it don't spread, not as quickly, and they don't stick around. You put it in the hands of the most powerful nations throughout history, and you tie it in culturally and politically to what you're doing, bam, you have one of the biggest religions. So I hope you guys aren't minding the length of these answers. Do you consider God a narcissist? 
Also, how much leeway are you willing to give the Bible when it motivates people to do good? Yeah, I think insofar as we're treating this God as an actual character, he's not just a narcissist, he is a straight up psychopath. And that term gets abused a lot, but when you create 108 billion people so far, and 100 billion of them are burning in hell forever, after a life of suffering for most people that have ever lived, this is a failure to understand history if you do not understand how bad most people's lives have been since the beginning of homo homo sapiens. And if you're an all-perfect God who's capable of doing something, and this is your end result, you're a psychopath. Now, he's not real, so we don't need to diagnose him, but insofar as the character goes, yes. How much leeway are you willing to give the Bible when it motivates people to do good? Not much. This is kind of similar to my previous question, but I'd like to specify something here. If you've read, and I'll compare it to the Greek myths, if you've read the Greek myths, those gods are horrendous. They are selfish and narcissistic. They play games with people's lives and livelihood. They are not anyone you'd want to emulate your life after. And yet many Many of them still have great moral tales to tell. You know, behind me I have Sisyphus. Over here on this wall I have Prometheus. Those are two of my favorite myths. And there's amazing things that you can pull out of those stories. And since those stories are not taken literally by anyone anymore these days, I mean, I'm sure there's a few people, but it's not an active religion that because some people take it literally is producing actual negative results in the world, I can just dismiss the bad parts of Zeus and say, well, this is what I like. And if I want to find some motivation or encouragement to do something good from those stories, great. No harm, no foul. I think someday the Bible will get to that level. And when it does, I won't have a problem with it and I'll give all the leeway in the world. But right now, when 2 billion people actively believe and orient their lives around it to such a degree that it infiltrates the culture, the world, politics, there's harm everywhere because of it, then no, get your wisdom elsewhere. Until we can remove the actual belief from this, this book, I think, will always do more harm than good. Do you ever look at the world news, more specifically Israel, as well as learning more and more are turning from the faith and question if the end time prophecies are real? Here's the thing. When you really start to look into the prophecies, you'll understand how many of them already weren't fulfilled. Like, it didn't happen. Jesus is a great example. He is not at all what the Messiah prophecies from the Old Testament describe him as, but Christianity has ignored those and they've pulled out of hindsight other things from the Bible that had nothing to do with him and work, if not straight up lie, to create fulfilled prophecies. It's like that with everything, and that would include the end times. You know, people love to point to the Euphrates drying up, but no one wants to talk about how there's supposed to be a few angels hanging out down there that are chained up. So I get like, like the storm that's caused when something looks like something from the Bible is happening, but it typically isn't happening in the way that it's described, or it didn't happen in the right time, or those prophecies weren't real prophecies, they were talking about events that were happening at that time, or they were prophecies for something that was going to happen in the lifetime of the person that was at that time, or in Revelation, it's actually, you know, an allusion to Rome and all of these things. The more that you understand that, the less power any of these prophecies have. Also, when you understand the vagueness and the game of prophecies, prophecy, and you understand that every generation sees themselves in the prophecies because of the vagueness, that's the power of it, you can only be fooled so many times. For those that want to understand that and see a history lesson on it, check out this video for me here. What do you think is the most damaging effect that evangelical Christianity and especially fundamentalist denominations have had on the U.S. in particular, be it cultural, political, etc.? And what, if anything, would you say is its biggest positive effect? Oh man, there are so many that I could answer for. Positive I'd say community. There are people that otherwise would be lonely that have a place they can go. They have a group they can fit in with, even if they don't typically fit in well with groups. And to that end, that is a positive. I don't think it's a net positive, but that's a positive side. The negative parts in the U.S., since you said that specifically, it would depend on the time. There was a time in the U.S. where slavery was pretty well accepted by Christians, biblically speaking, and rightfully so. If we're talking about closer to today, the harm in the U.S. from evangelical Christianity would probably be just to the individual. False hope, confusion, shame, guilt, fear. These emotions are 100 hundred percent drummed up by the religion. They're used in the religion. These people are literally preyed on. EY, not AY. Also, at this point in time in the U.S., for evangelicals, which make up about 40 percent of the Christians in the U.S., and Christians make up a very large 
percentage of the U.S. still, that affects everything. That affects politics. We've seen that in Oklahoma and Louisiana and Texas lately. It affects education, the amount of people that deny evolution, the amount of people that are just generally against science. So there's a handful of answers for you. Here's one that a lot of people ask, should I tell, in this case, my mom I've deconverted and they go on to list their specific situation. Many people ask something similar to that. I have a video on how to come out as an atheist or a non-believer, at least of a particular religion. And I hope that there's more helpful information in there. If you should or shouldn't come out, I think is 100% dependent off you and your personal life. If you're a child, especially if you're dependent on your parents, depending on who your parents are, again, so many factors, right? No, that's probably not a good idea. But generally speaking, I think if you are an adult and you have people in your life that believe differently, you should be able to have real conversations with with them and be who you are. I'm not defined by my atheism, but I'm also not defined by being a Christian. And so since I was in a Christian community, in a Christian marriage, acting as a Christian parent, when I no longer was a Christian, I felt that I wasn't able to be myself until I came out. And I was simply unwilling to live a lie. And it just wasn't authentic anymore. I couldn't, I simply couldn't do it. And I had everything to lose. Which leads to the next questions many of you asked. Let's try to answer it here and then we'll keep going. The number one question I got was your wife, how are you raising your kids? How did it go for you? I've talked about it in some videos. I do keep it a little closer to the chest just for her privacy, but I've had an incredible wife is what I'll always say. Someone that handles this better than I think anyone else I know could have. Just personality wise and the way that my wife and I's relationship is luckily and thanks to her and to how I handled it, it worked out. It was hard. It was a long process. It's not over. We deal with it all the time because it affects every part of our life. What things will I go to? What won't I go to? What are we teaching the kids? What are they reading? What kind of school are they going to? Oh, here's the friends that are in our life. Oh, they're saying this. This is why I would never encourage anybody to just sign up for being unequally yoked. The Bible had that good information, but this is when it happened. It happened 10 years into my marriage after I had two kids and the ball was already rolling. So I am dealing with things and compromising with things as is my wife that neither of us thought we would be. And I'm sure many of you would expect me to take a harder line with some of these things than I am in real life, but this is the real world. And I am the one that kind of disrupted it. So my main goal, again, is always reducing harm. And obviously that goes for my children, but I'm not their only parent and I'm not their only influence. And there's just a reality to the community that we are in. And so finding that balance, finding that compromise is ongoing. And it's why I don't like to give advice about it because I don't have it all figured out. I just know that so far this is working for me and my family. And I know that it always will because my wife and I have this intention, no matter what, we will not let this come between our family. So it's a roundabout kind of non-answer. And it usually catches people way off guard when they hear I have a wife that's a believer and they have all kinds of questions. Does she watch your videos? How does she possibly still believe when you're so good at explaining these things? All of that. So a few questions that I get often. No, she doesn't watch the videos. We kind of made the choice that that's just not going to be very beneficial and helpful to have on the forefront. We live life together every day. We joke, we laugh, we talk, we make decisions together, we budget together, we parent together, we enjoy our children. We have all kinds of stuff. If every single day we were fighting or arguing about, well, you got that verse wrong or what about this content? It's not how real world stuff works. And if I was that kind of a person that wanted to constantly be doing that with my wife, I can assure you that's when the marriage would have failed. So as much as I want her to accept me for who I am and respect me and my lack of belief, I need to be willing to respect her for who she is and for her belief. And of course, I don't respect what she believes, but I can absolutely respect her as an individual who believes it. And this is encouragement that I would give to anyone that still has believers in their life. If anything, we have a higher duty and responsibility because we have been where they have been, but they have not been where we are. I know what it's like to believe. I know why I believed. I know why I believed despite the evidence against it. I know why I believed despite those hard verses in the Bible. That's where she's at. I get that. So it's easier for me to sympathize and compromise. She has never and seemingly can't get herself to be in the position that I am in, even hypothetically. So why should I be able to expect her to think the way I do? Hopefully that answers a vast majority of the questions that I got. What do you think about the development of the dating of the Shroud of Turin? So I've only seen a little bit of this. And honestly, the Shroud of Turin is not something that ever really excited me as a believer or a non-believer. So speaking from a non-believer standpoint who is non-educated in this, let's just say that the dating is all correct and it absolutely comes from the first century CE. 
Okay. And then what? Seriously, then what? I mean, do we have DNA from Jesus to compare it to? Like, it's a whole century. You know, there's a lot of leaps that I do know are made about it. Oh, it seems to, you know, suggest that there was trauma that looks like it was from a crucifixion. Suggest that there might be, that it was trauma that looks like something that could have been from a crucifixion. Like, that's a lot of dots that need connecting. And even so, okay, it was a shroud of someone that was crucified. Can we get there? Sure. And it was from the first century. A lot of other people besides Jesus were crucified in the first century. So again, like, what is the point? Oh, and somehow you can link it straight to Jesus? Okay, fine. So what? I don't hold a mythicist position. So, I mean, I'm willing to admit there was probably a guy named Jesus that walked around and said some of these things. It's also very possible that there wasn't. I'm not sold on either side. Does it prove a resurrection? Well, isn't it a mystery, Brandon, how it got on there, how it made that imprint? I don't know. Maybe it is. Is it answered by a resurrection? Is it answered by the God of the Bible? This is my point. A lot of times people who are already believers, they want to make this connection. And as soon as something can't be explained, they're like, God explains it best. What if there was like some weird meteor in the sky that caused some kind of radiation that made this imprint because this guy was getting buried at just the perfect time. Well, that sounds so far-fetched. And a resurrected Jesus doesn't? There are so many more likely but still insane scenarios that would need to be contended with before I would just jump to, oh, this proves everything in the Bible to be true. That's my quick uneducated answer on this. It is often said by Christians that if there's no resurrection, there's no Christianity. What if anything was a big piece or pieces of evidence that eventually convinced you that the resurrection story was not true? It's an interesting question, and it's hard to really go back and remember the series of events. You know, I dealt with, first of all, is my version of Christianity true? Long before I dealt with, is Christianity true? And then I dealt with, is my understanding of this God true? You know, considering that maybe he's just not the God I thought he was. Maybe he's more of a Calvinist God, you know? And so there was a whole breakdown before I kind of got into the hard evidence of, oh, this thing didn't actually happen happen and here's why. One of the things that is pointed to a lot for me growing up was all of the witnesses to the resurrection. And it sounds silly because we talk about it so much and it's so obvious to people that are in this space. But the first time I really connected the dots that we didn't have 500 people saying something as a witness, that we had one man making an assertion of 500 people, I was like, whoa, (laughs) this is one thing to dispute not hundreds. Then you get into the contradictions between the Gospels on the resurrection, when it happened, who was there, where Jesus went afterwards, all of those things. And you're like, oh man, stories, unreliable, inaccurate. Then you get to the anonymous Gospels. You take away the veil of eyewitness testimony and slowly and surely enough things just added up where I had no more reason to believe in the resurrection of Jesus than I did any of the other myths that I was so very familiar with and absolutely considered myth. What was the difference? My indoctrination, the fact that the people around me believed it. It wasn't any more of a believable story and it didn't have any more evidence for it than these other things. And the full weight of understanding that along with everything else that was crashing down put it in perspective. In the divine hit in his argument, do you think that we should be able to do without the non-resistant part. Doesn't that suggest that God can't overcome our resistance if he really wanted us to believe? I mean, yes, I agree with you. I think the non-resistant part, though, makes it more powerful within the counter-argument side of things. So again, the divine hiddenness argument, for those of you that aren't very familiar, and I do have this video on it here, it's put forward in many different ways, but generally, if you have an all-perfect, loving God who wants a relationship with us and desires that none should be lost, like why is he so hard to find? Whether that is because he's actually invisible or because he doesn't answer prayer seemingly or because you've never had a personal experience, all of these different things, we would expect an actual God to actually be measurable within his creation and show up and do the things he said he was going to show up and do. And that's really brushing over the argument very heavily. And there was a philosopher, J.L. Schellenberg, who kind of put forward this non-resistant non-belief because a lot of the argument that can come forward is, oh, you just hate God. Oh, you just wanted to sin. You don't want to believe. You don't want there to be a God. But the reality is that there are non-resistant non-believers. There are people that are open to believing in a God if they could just be convinced of it, but for whatever reason, they simply aren't. And that's usually a lack of evidence or a lack of personal experience, which kind of puts the onus on God. And so, no, it shouldn't be necessary because an all-powerful God that is actually loving, you're right, should seek us out. But it makes the argument stronger, I think, that, hey, I'm here, I'm willing, but 
you know, you've got to do your part. And I'm, again, totally abusing all of these concepts for sake of brevity. So forgive me, but hopefully that answers your question. What's been the hardest part of your deconstruction? My first answer is, of course, my family, but that's more of my deconversion. And I want to take your question as seriously as possible. Part of the deconstruction is really the choice to actually do it honestly. I think a lot of people think they're deconstructing. A lot of people think they're being skeptical. A lot of people, you know, oh yeah, no, I I definitely, I want to know the truth. And I'm speaking anecdotally about what I've seen with my friends. You know, when I was kind of deconstructing, I almost want to say a lot of my friends were deconstructing with me until I went too far. And then all of a sudden they were like the most fervent believers you could have ever known. All their questions seemingly disappeared and they had nothing but answers for my questions. And I don't think that it was anything manipulative or horrible. I think it was a quick reflex, a defense defense mechanism kicked in like, oh, whoa, Brandon's taking this way further than I thought we were going. I'm not ready to be an atheist. I'm not ready to actually question this God. I'm not ready to actually blaspheme. And unfortunately, I think it has this doubling down effect. Like, whoa, look at that slippery slope. I better avoid that. And now instead of being like, yeah, that doesn't make sense. That is weird. I I wonder how we explain that. It was, well, don't you know? Bam, apologetics. And it wasn't just one friend or two friends. Like I saw this as the response from most people in my life. They were open with me. They were questioning. I don't know if doubting is the right word, but they were willing to kind of be on this journey with me until I went too far. And seeing that reaction from them, it definitely made me want to pull back too. And so that tipping point of really committing, like, no, I'm actually going to follow this wherever it goes, whether it's another God, another religion, no religion. And Again, like people who haven't been in this situation, they can't understand. The idea when you are that level of believer of being an atheist is not only disgusting and horrifying and terrifying and shameful and everything else. It's literally like you can't believe it. I can't tell you how many times and I feel so bad for this. I told my wife, it's not like I'm going to become an atheist. You know, as I went further down that deconstruction hole, like I've got this new problem, but it's not like I'm going to become an atheist. Like, oh, I see this so clearly now and this doesn't work, but it's not like I'm going to become an atheist. But there was a point where I had to be more honest about what I was doing and say, okay, like if this is where it leads, I need to be ready for that. And I need to continue to look despite that. That's the hardest part of deconstruction, I think. My question is related to books. Would you consider updating the video where you talked about the books that have helped you through your deconversion process? I would really love getting more book recommendations. So a couple things in the description of, I think every single video, there is a link to an Amazon page that lists all the books I think are helpful for deconversion. And it's not just, you know, new atheism books. Some of them are about evolution. Some of them are about neuroscience and the brain. Some of them are about cosmology. And so I think that there's a lot of things there that help me that can help you. So if you want more than just the 25 books I covered, I think there's like 80 books on that list. What do you think about the sociological phenomenon? phenomenon of religion in general. In your opinion, is it worth keeping around? I think religion, and I've said this before, and again, it's probably multifaceted, but I think that it is a evolutionary response. I think it's something that we created to fill gaps, to give answers, to give meaning, to tie people together, to do a lot of things. I think it was kind of the first attempt at philosophy, and it just went its own direction. I think it's part of our evolutionary history. We are people that survived by telling stories. We imparted information for a long time before we had a way of writing it or a way of of producing it just verbally. The development of speech meant a lot of things, and it meant that we could ask questions, and it also meant that we could try to answer those questions. And I understand very organically, I mean, if you've ever just spent a lot of time in nature, I'm an avid hiker and wilderness backpacker, and I've spent a lot of time alone and just with a select other few out in the wilderness with really not much. And whether it's the fear when you see a bear or what lightning really feels like at 13,000 feet and you're uncovered, or a flat flash flood in a canyon or any of these things, of course people attached meaning to that. And we see those things that I just referenced in like all religions. We see people's fears acknowledged and explained. And I think that is a big basis for the beginning of religion. For its use today, again, community, fitting in, tribalism. There's a book, I think, is it Sebastian Younger on tribalism that was really fascinating. And there's been so many studies done on groups of people and sociologically how we experience things together and relate to one another. And so, yeah, religion has been a pinning of that for a long time. And I don't think that it needs to die, but 
I do think that if all religions are kind of made up, if people eventually evolutionary get to the point through critical thinking and rationality that is just, well, we know that's not true. As we get more answers to things, we now know why lightning happens. We know why a flood happens. We know certain realities that we just couldn't know before and they simply erase and don't provide room for the more mythological explanations. And I think as that continues to happen, something will take its place. I don't know what it'll be. And again, it could be good or it could be bad, or it'll just be a different form of religion. We'll call it something else. Maybe everyone will become much more political. Maybe everyone will choose a favorite philosophy and they'll fight over that. I don't think we're immune from the placeholder of religion is maybe what I'm trying to say. Whether it's worthwhile or not, I think is based off its net benefit to mankind. And I think it was important for us to prosper for a long time. And now I think that it's more detrimental, generally speaking. Which Christian denomination that you know of do you think gets it most right? As in which, in your view, comes the closest to properly interpreting the words and intentions of the scriptures? And this person actually answers what my answer is going to be. First of all, I don't think you can have a consistent, correct Christian denomination because you have mutually exclusive claims in the Bible. This week I just covered James, and in doing so I showed the contradictions between James by works and Paul's by faith for salvation or justification. So if you have a denomination that believes in faith plus works and a denomination that believes in faith, they're both right, but they're also both wrong. The problem isn't the denominations, it's the lack of continuity in the scriptures and apparently also from this witness of the Holy Spirit. However, there are some things that are spelled out in the Bible that that you have to use almost as superseding facts above others. So if in the Bible it says God chose who would be saved, which it does, that he predestined those he would call, which it does, that the elect are few, which it does, and on and on and on, I think you have to, even if there's verses that point to the opposite of that, kind of go with that. And that looks a lot like Calvinism. It also matches up a lot better with the character of God that we see displayed instead of the more Christianized ideas idealized version of this God. God doesn't have to love everybody. Not everyone will go to heaven. Apparently, God just made some people as fodder. And it's not, again, emotionally satisfying, but it's maybe the most biblically consistent theology you can pull. Okay, we have a lot of favorites, and a lot of you asked favorites, but this person comments all the time. They deserve some answers. I should also first say, if you asked me this tomorrow, you'd get a different answer. This is going to be what's on the top of my mind today. Favorite food, any kind of bread, unfortunately. Favorite U.S. state, probably. Utah. They really have it all. First of all, they have five of the best national parks. I mean, you get everything. You get the mountains, you get skiing, but you also get deserts and canyon lands. Oh, it's awesome. And I've done it all down there. A lot of my ultras that I ran and raced in when I was doing my distance running was down in Utah because it's my favorite place to go. Running 50 miles through Zion was pretty freaking epic. Favorite secular band? Oh my gosh. So after books comes music for me. And last time I answered this question, at the time I was listening to a lot of Greta Van Fleet. I'm a sucker for all 90s music. I've really kind of hit back up my grunge phase, listening to a lot of Nirvana and Alice in Chains. I was also an emo kid for a while. In fact, just yesterday I was dancing in the living room with my daughter to some, well, now it's Andrew McMahon in the wilderness, but before it was Jack's Mannequin and before that it was something corporate. So, I mean, I, I love all kinds of music. I really like folk music some bluegrass guitar, stuff like that. Ah, everything. How do you balance having a full-time job and a YouTube channel at the same time, a channel where you post three videos a week and interact as much as you do in the comment sections? Do you work remote? Thank you for acknowledging that. Yeah, my, my full-time job is between 40 and 50 hours a week. I try not to let what I'm doing right now take away from my family at all, which means a lot of late nights or lunch breaks during my day job. I'm still a one-man show, so the editing that goes into all of this is also becoming very time-consuming, especially with the podcast guests that takes a lot longer. And it's the reason that I can't script. Scripting adds a whole other dimension. And so there are many times, and I know many of you are very complimentary with my ability to pull things off the cuff, but I feel like I do a disservice to every single video and topic that I do because I know if I sat down for a few hours and thought it out and scripted it out, I would say it just so. I would cover it just right. And I just don't have the time to do that. And so this is what you get because I have to cram things in. And so honestly, if I wasn't able to speak so well off the cuff, I simply couldn't do this channel.
channel. Because when it's time to make my Tuesday takedown, I find a clip, I play it, it's usually the first time I'm seeing it in its entirety, and then I react. And that's what it is. The secular Bible study stuff has taken a lot longer because I reread each book before I do it. So that's, you know, once a week I'm reading a book of the Bible, and some of those are harder than others. I make notes about what I want to cover. I group up all the contradictions I want to cover. That takes some research. I jot down which problematic passages I want to cover, and that takes a lot of time. So I'm kind of excited for that to be done. By the way, I will announce here what I think I'm going to replace the Thursday episode with will be a study on every individual in the Bible one by one. So the first Thursday after secular Bible study series, after Revelation, it will be Adam or maybe Adam and Eve together. And then we'll do Cain and Abel. So yeah, maybe pairs, you know, where appropriate, Jacob and Esau, etc. But we'll just move all the way down through the line. That will take us probably a few years. So I'm looking forward to that. So to answer your question, I've always prided myself on my time management skills. And whenever I get a chance, I sit down and work. It's also probably why I'm not in the shape I was two years ago and why I'm not still running ultras. I have replaced some of that time and some of my other work time and consulting time for this. So eventually I might like to get back to a little better balance in life, but as long as I'm paying the bills and I have all the time for my family, we're good. I know you said you like philosophy. Do you view it more in a practical sense, philosophy about how to live and deal with ethics, or are you just into philosophy for philosophy's sake? Think of weird metaphysical ideas like fictionalism and subjective idealism. If it's the Ladder, what is the most esoteric philosophy that you buy into slash think is interesting? I've always been interested in philosophy. Again, being an avid reader, it's hard to avoid. Even the greatest works of classic literature are filled with philosophy and you can pull them out and then you see what they attach to and then you read those actual philosophers and all of a sudden you develop a keen interest in this. And so I like it for its sake. I also like it for its practicality. You know, if we're talking about practicality, I've gotten a lot from probably like everyone and this almost feels redundant or silly to say, but I do love stoicism. One of the first things that I ever read was find a way to love what you already have is essentially what it came down to. And I don't care if you think all the right and holiday stuff is overblown. When you get good practical advice, like find a way to love what you already have, aka truly be content, that is just good, healthy, beautiful advice. I love that. By the way, most philosophies offer things like that. Jesus has said things that are absolutely as beautiful, profound, and useful. He's also said some horrible things. And, you know, I love the Aristotelian ethics, but that guy was also down with slavery. So, you know, you have to take the bits that work. Again, going back to that verse, test everything and keep what works, keep what's beneficial, keep what's true. And that's how I view philosophy. So I would never say I'm a stoic or I'm an absurdist or I'm a nihilist or I'm an existentialist, anything like this. I would never put myself in a camp. I like collecting ideas. I like collecting knowledge and wisdom and putting it together to make kind of a personal philosophy that works because our lives are extremely individualistic. And what works for me in my situation with the people I have in my life and my set of circumstances may not work for other people. And so adhering to a philosophy is not something that I would ever necessarily recommend. But building a philosophy, I think, is incredibly useful. As for the esoteric philosophy, I wouldn't say that I'm bought into any, but I'm very interested in and have no problem considering the existence of some things like solipsism, the fact that maybe this is all just me. Maybe it's just one mind. Maybe I'm just creating everything around me. Better put is the only thing I know that can exist is my mind, right? And then there's things that branch out from there. Solipsism isn't claiming all those other things. Now, I believe that other people are having their own experiences and consciousness, but I can't prove it. I base my life like it's true. That's why I, you know, I would never just buy into any of these. I also think panpsychism is a really interesting thing to look at. There's some people here that might think that makes me sound really loose loosey-goosey considering my otherwise strict, rational, skeptical mind. But I'm very open to these kinds of things, and I think they're fascinating to think about. But yeah, subjective idealism is interesting. Simulation theory is interesting, if, if you would categorize that as well. Hyperstition is something I've been reading and researching a lot lately. Essentially, that fictional concepts can manifest themselves in reality because of groupthink or feedback loops, and kind of have seen that play out in certain ways. I mean, what you want to call reality 
reality also matters. But that I think has maybe some practical application from a sociological point of view. I love non-dualism, which, you know, of course comes from a particular Vedanta that I can't remember, but yeah, there's oh all of it. I love it. I really, really enjoy it. What is your position on free will? I've been pretty clear about this. I am a determinist. I 100% do not believe in the idea of free will, specifically the way most people think about free will, libertarian free will, biblical free will, anything like that. I've listened to every debate I can, I've read every book I can, and I simply am just not convinced by anyone who makes any kind of an argument for free will. I just, I don't see how it can exist. I also understand how hard it is to come to that conclusion. I know how adamantly I thought that was ridiculous for the longest time, but here I am, full on determinist. Do you have a top three favorite philosophers or thinkers? I have 300 favorite philosophers and thinkers. I don't even know where to begin, probably just because I brought up his name earlier, Epictetus. That's that guy right there. Epictetus is brilliant to me. The Incridian is one of my favorite works of all time. I love the fact that he was a slave who was still able to do this. This, you know, a lot of people point to Marcus Aurelius and Stoicism in general, and he's a Roman emperor, and I love Marcus Aurelius, don't get me wrong, but I would never put him as high as someone who had to live out their philosophy more so like Epictetus. And it is about controlling your thoughts. It is about virtue ethics for sure. It's about inner freedom. And I just think that it's beautiful, it's useful, it's time. I don't think it's perfect. I don't think he as an individual was perfect. That's never something I would try to point to, which you'll understand for my second person I'm going to say, which is Nietzsche. Many people view Nietzsche as bad. He got a bad rap from his sister. He is often looked at as just a fad for philosophers. Nietzsche's thinking is absolutely brilliant. I don't care. And some of his more famous works are actually, I think, some of his worst works. But if you read The Gay Science or On the Genealogies of Morals or even some of his personal letters, oh, I am, I'm just such a huge fan. He's done so much for me in helping me think about things differently and being willing to think about things that are hard or unpopular. So Nietzsche, as much as I hate the individual Schopenhauer, his stance on pessimism is pretty interesting, uh, but I wouldn't ever put him in my top three. Like, how do you how do you do that? I was early on more attracted to like the transcendentalist, loved me some Thoreau and Emerson. They will always have a special spot in my heart, even more into the poetry side with like Walt Whitman, who is still kind of on that transcendentalist viewpoint. I think I could read Emerson all day. I think it's just good quote after good quote after good quote. I've read Walden from Thoreau so many times. It's what actually got me into like long distance solo wilderness backpacking and showed me the importance of alone time and contemplation. I mean, so again, like some of these thoughts I might have outgrown or some of these people I disagree with, but in terms of what I think about the practical application to my life, these are some that have played a role. In terms of philosophy, though, in general, aside from stoicism, I have a deep love for existential and absurdism, but I don't know how to choose. And then thinkers in general, you opened it up to just thinkers. Oh, that I'm sorry. That's going to have to be its own video because when I think of thinkers, I also think of writers and novelists. You guys know I love Dostoevsky. I love James Joyce. I hate him as a person, but the portrait of the artist as a young man is one of the most amazing things I've ever read in my entire life. And every single time I read it, I get more from it. Bertrand Russell, though, if we're just kind of bringing things back into here in terms of a thinker and a writer and a speaker, I love Bertrand Russell. I think he's so important important for so many things. So yeah, hopefully that answered some. Why does being angry immediately disqualify non-belief? It doesn't in general, and it shouldn't, but it does. This is the reality. It does to the believer. So you often hear me apologize when I get heated, when I get angry. It's because I often think of my audience, even though I know most of you who are watching now and who interact with me in the comments are non-believers, I think of it still more for people who are doubting or deconstructing who are still in that belief. And anger is very unattractive to a lot of people even if it's justified. And so I'm glad you asked this question because I'd like to say everyone is allowed to be angry. There is nothing wrong with anger. Anger serves us. Anger is good. In fact, many people who are in very unhealthy psychological states, it's because they're not dealing with their anger. With that caveat said, when I am hesitant to show anger, it's because people who are struggling with their belief or Christians in general who want to dismiss me or dismiss an atheist at large, anger is the easiest way to do it. Oh, see, you just you just hate God. You're just sad your life didn't go a certain way. You just think God should have done more for you, blah, 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 blah. 
It's disgusting. It's stupid. But there's no sense in giving someone a foothold. And generally speaking, I'm not really angry anymore. I'm allowed to be angry. I would be justified if I were angry. But a lot of my empathy comes from my belief in determinism. And that's something I'd like to talk about more in future videos. Once you really understand that we are all a true product of our time and place and previous circumstances, it kind of takes all that zip and zing out of hating someone or thinking someone is so stupid or so wrong. And I still fall into that from time to time. Of course, I am only human. But if I were born as them with their genetic makeup, their parents, their history, their culture, their environment, I would be them. I would think as they think and do as they've done. I know this. I recognize this. And so I forget kind of why I brought this point up. Let's attribute this to sick brain. But I think it's okay to be angry, but it's not useful for my goals with this channel to display anger most of the time, except to normalize the legitimate position that many of us atheists find ourselves in who have deconverted. Here's an interesting one. If you erase exactly one verse from the Bible so that it never existed and couldn't cause future harm, what would it be? I would need to think about that, but I'm going to give you an answer with no forethought. As I think about a verse I'd want to take out, there's 20 more that sound just like it that do the same amount of harm. I was just trying to think, is there a part in the Bible where it says this is all true? And I thought of 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. If we took that one out, we could at least say, hey, not all of this is true. Not all of it is useful. Christians would still believe that it is, but I don't think any single verse would do it. Not even a single book would do it, actually. I don't know. I'll have to think about that. Would you ever consider doing a conference or retreat at some vacation destination where fans could attend, listen to talks by you and other guests, and interact with others with common beliefs? I would attend one. I don't know if I would ever throw one. There's something that feels a little pompous about that, like, hey, mind shift fans, come down here. And it doesn't have to be. I don't know if other creators have done that. I don't want to say anything bad. It just wouldn't feel very comfortable for me. Also, this is one of the things about having, you know, a Christian wife still is if I couldn't do that kind of thing with my family, which I couldn't, I don't think I'd want to do it. I would go attend a conference for sure, but without like her support, those kinds of things I think would not be as fun for me as they might be for someone that's single or who's doing it with their wife, who's also a non-believer. So I'm not blaming her for taking something away from me. It's just a reality of our situation, but I do hope to attend and speak at some atheist conferences for lack of a better term. What are your thoughts on Eastern religions? So first of all, I think Eastern religions get grouped together too frequently. They are vastly different from themselves. There are some common themes, just like there's common Western themes, but I think Eastern religions because they're older, have a little bit more fluidity than some of the Western, so to speak, religions do. Most of them are more philosophical in nature, or again, a lot of these other religions have pantheons, which open things up to be very different. It's the monotheistic religions that I think get you in the most trouble. Now, there is harm, and I'm continuing to learn about the harm that comes from, you know, straight up Hinduism or Buddhism and things like this. So I don't want to say like, oh, they're not real. They're not real religions. They're not contenders. They don't produce harm. They do, they are, etc. The way that I've ever read them has been more for their philosophy. And I've been so far removed from ever having a true belief in them or from knowing many people that have a belief in them that I think of them in the same way I do when I read the Egyptian myths, the Greek myths, the Mesoamerican myths, etc. How I've utilized them has just been more proverbial wisdom. But again, I'm learning more about their harm and so many people still and have in history believed in them that I don't want to take it lightly. Is there any type of immoral thing which Yahweh isn't generally claimed to have committed or commanded. Is there even one crime he's innocent of? Oh, that's so funny. Well, the big ones. He's murdered. He's genocided. He's enslaved. Rape? Yahweh himself? He, well, he's, yeah, you said commanded. Absolutely. Theft has been commanded by Yahweh. Absolutely. He's never worshipped other gods. My other answer would be he's never committed blasphemy but we wouldn't consider those crimes. Then there's the modern stuff. You know, he's never shorted stocks unethically, stuff like that. But no, I think he's done all the big bad things that are maybe more universal or traditional crime. What do you think can be done to restore separation of church and state? That's a tough one. Voting is the obvious answer, even though I have very little faith in our political systems in general. 
general, but the only way they're going to be upheld is by having judges that will uphold it. I know that's the truth because there's too many people working to eradicate it. Individual stands are a big one. I just read the other day, you know, I did the video on Oklahoma and the Ten Commandments in the classrooms, and there's something like 46 school districts that have openly defied that. And I, I'm sorry, I might be mixing up the Louisiana and the Oklahoma issue. Those school districts are actually following the Constitution, but they are breaking state law. And so I think those kinds of stands early and often are going to be incredibly important in pushing back. And awareness. I think that even, and this is a hard, hard battle, but educating Christians on why even they should not want a rise in Christian nationalism or an erosion of church and state. The easiest way to do would be to point to the coming Islamic influence and rise in Islam in general, and that eventually Christians will be in the minority, and will they want their children having to read the Quran in school, having to recite Islamic prayers in school? No. So, you know, protect this now kind of a thing. So appealing to their humanity in that sense. But yeah, it's Oof, it's very scary. What other religions, ancient or modern, are you most fascinated by or most interested in learning more about? Do you have a favorite among the different mythologies? Lastly, why do you think it is so very easy for most religious people to readily dismiss other religions as man-made or mythology without even having ever read much of them? Okay, there's a lot there. Let's rapid fire this. Because they didn't grow up with it, to answer the last part of your question. That's really it. If you are already convinced through sheer indoctrination that your God is the correct God and everyone you know love, respect, and like believes in that God, the idea of some foreigner believing some old thing from some false religion, and that's the thing, the Bible, Christianity, preps you for this. When you are in a monotheistic religion, the argument is simple. Well, look, it's a pantheon of gods. Like, not all those gods are real. That's what man does when they create God. So then all you have to really contend with, if, say, you're a Christian, is Judaism or Islam. And you can say, oh, well, Judaism just doesn't recognize Christ, but here's all the reasons Jesus is true. And then with Islam, you say, yeah, this is what happens when the devil twists your scriptures. You know, it's born from the same God, but look, in our version, we see the split between Isaac and Ishmael. And so you very quickly just condense down all world religion to why Christianity is true, and it's reinforced and it's backed up. But yeah, you're right. It is ridiculous, and it is one of the first things that started to catch my eye when I was a believer that, simple to say now, but if I was born in a Hindu country, I'd be a Hindu. If I was born in a Muslim country, I'd be a Muslim. And if those were my communities and my teachers and my parents, that's what would happen. And I'd be arguing the same thing from their position. And that intellectual honesty forces you to come to terms with why you believe what you believe. And I think many people are simply unwilling to do that. You asked what my favorites were from mythology, Egyptian and Greek mythology. I do love the Native American storytelling and their myths. I'm a big fan of Native American history in general. And so that has become increasingly popular to me, even over like Greek mythology. But the Greek stories contain everything you could ever want. Are you religious or spiritual at all? What I mean is, do you believe there's something out there or anything supernatural, God, spirits, etc.? I don't. I'm open to it. I'm truly agnostic when it comes to other gods, a creator, someone that wound this all up. I just think there's no evidence that they want to communicate with us or that they're good. What am I to do with that? I'm not just going to seek after them. I understand deism. I understand people that take some pleasure or benefit in believing that there's something bigger out there. I, too, am blown away often when I think about things like love or consciousness or beauty. Those grip me. I understand wanting to be like, how, why, where? I really do. I just don't think we have any better reason to say God than the word universe. And so that's where a lot of that kind of new age spiritualism comes from, is everything is connected and it's all about energy and love and the universe. And I'm not meaning to speak, you know, with this negative connotation around it, but again, like there's no proof, there's no evidence of that. We're just kind of jumping to a new conclusion. I think that that stuff also equally can get abused and create false hope and answers for people. At the same time, I'm not like a hardline materialist. I'm just open, but think we don't have any good reason to believe in any of the things that have been put forth so far. So until something wants to be revealed, I just don't know and kind of don't care. But no, I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in the supernatural. I don't believe in anything like that. But I do like the beauty and the poetry of like everything being made up of energy and energy just transferring. And, and that to me gives a nice poetic 
dramatic answer for death. You know, I've had conversations with my family about when I die, I want to be buried with a tree so that my energy is providing sustenance and life for the next thing. And it's something beautiful you can go and look at. And even though I know in no way am I there, it's still something. I'm not some angry, calloused, heartless person over here because I deny the existence of a particular God. I still do see those beautiful things and want to create meaning and symbolism in my life. I'm a big fan of ritual still, but I would not say I'm spiritual and definitely not religious. What is your opinion on near-death experiences in general? I freaking hate NDEs. They are never consistent. They don't mean anything. It's not death. It's near death. Whatever happens in the brain is happening in the brain. And if there was a God that wanted to show people something when they get close to death, that's so stupid. That that even makes the divine hiddenness argument worse. I have to cut off circulation for a certain period of time before you're willing to let me see heaven or hell. And if I do and can get myself back by medical intervention, which you had nothing to do with, that's okay with you. The best I can understand is that we have this DMT in our body. A small amount gets released at death. It probably happens when our body thinks it's about to die. People trip. They see all kinds of stuff. It's influenced from what is in their subconscious, from their upbringing and their culture. So of course it looks meaningful and specific and they come back. They have this story. It's impactful. I get it. And people talk about, oh, what they say on their deathbed, but it's also confirmation bias. They're only talking about the ones that say like, Jesus. They don't talk about the person that says ladybug because they're out of their mind on pain meds. You know what I mean? So I don't buy into it at all. And I've looked at it a lot. I just think that there are better explanations and that when you follow the logic all the way down the well, it only leads to worse answers. What's the reason behind your YouTuber name, MindShift? I would love to tell you there's this huge story and I took months and months to really think about it and, and pick out just the right name. I'm pretty fast at making decisions. So I hopped on YouTube and there's a little thing where you can check for usernames. And I sat here for a minute before I typed anything in. I wanted it to be something about truth. I thought about like truth seeker or something with knowledge or wisdom, but that sounded a little pretentious. There were some things that I thought of, I can't remember now, but they sounded a little too antagonistic. I didn't want anything that was like in your face. I just, I wanted it to be something open, something inviting, but also that communicated what was going on. And I thought about my own story and I thought about like, how is this defined? There was a real change that happened and not just from losing my faith, but in my life in general, in how I processed information, in how I approached new decisions, in how I approached other people. It was like this total shift. So then I had the word shift and then it was just another second or two before I arrived at it. It was a mind shift. It's this entire kind of change from the very top. That was it. I hope that this helped you understand me better and maybe enjoy my future previous videos more going forward. Thank you again for all your support in any fashion that you do it. I am still blown away that this is at 50,000. The next goal, let's just go for it. 100,000. That would feel unbelievable to me. I, I never thought I would be a YouTuber. This wasn't something I ever wanted to do. And it's like this huge, new, important part of my life. So I really appreciate it. Have a wonderful day. Until part two or the next video, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support. My Iconoclist, Anne, Boris, GVI, Jacob, Jason, Joe, Kiboga, Perry, Rocket, Sean, and Strong Rex. My Humanist Heroes, Imposter, James, Jared, and Christy. My Atheist Advocates, Caleb, Jeff, Jeffrey, Jimothy, Jones, Mrs. Webb, Paul, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my Secular Scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you just enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine people.